Holy God, open our eyes to your presence, open our hearts to your love, open our ears to your call. Amen. From Mark's Gospel, chapter 3. A crowd said to him, Your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? Whoever does the will of God is my mother, brother, and sister. Families are complex, aren't they? They can be both beautiful and messy, times in the same breath. We love them fiercely, and yet they can drive us crazy. They know us better than anyone else, which is precisely the reason why they know which buttons to push. Sometimes our families are the ones we are born into. And sometimes they are the ones we create for ourselves. But we all long for a family where we can be loved unconditionally, where we feel cherished and nourished. Just a couple of days ago, I was deeply touched when a child who is not a blood relative of mine called me uncle for the first time. Yet families can also be a source of enormous frustrations. They highlight our strengths while relentlessly reminding us of those quirks that we just wish could finally shed. As I've been reflecting on this gospel passage from Mark, I noticed something fascinating that I had never realized in all my many years of studying the Bible. According to Mark, It wasn't Judas, the temple authorities, or even the Pharisees or Sadducees to first betray Jesus, but his own family. This realization is so uncomfortable that both Matthew and Mark, who based their texts on Matthew and Luke, who based their texts on Mark, completely glossed over it. And translators over the centuries have done an astounding job of refocusing our attention away from this episode. Yet in the New International Version, we hear it clearly. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Jesus' ministry threatened to disrupt so many aspects of human uh, society that even Mary and his siblings were not ready for it yet. They stood outside, calling him to come out, trying to seize him by force if necessary, as one translation would have it, and stop his ministry. Why? Perhaps they feared for his safety. Perhaps his radical message of God's love for sinners and outcasts threatens their family status. Whatever the reason, at this moment, Jesus' family was not with him, but against him. And if Mary, the mother of God, is capable of betraying Jesus in such a public way, what can we expect of our own families? Let me share you, uh, let me share a story with you. In 1989, at the height of the AIDS crisis, a young man named Patrick was dying in a hospital in New York. His biological family rejected him for being gay, but his friend, Kathy, was by his side. As Patrick came close to death, he turned to Kathy and whispered, I want my mother. She knew that his mother had refused to see him, but she tracked her down nonetheless and convinced her to come to the hospital, if only for a minute. When they arrived, Patrick mustered the strength to say, I'm sorry. His mother replied, No, don't say that. I'm sorry. 
and I love you. Just a few breaths later, he passed away. In this final moment, he found peace not only with his chosen family, but also with his biological mother. In this one family, love won. But countless others have not been that fortunate. In today's gospel, Jesus redefines the concept of family and creates a new community, a new world that welcomes those who have been cast out by society and even their own families. This shocking and heartbreaking scene where Jesus' family in a desperate amount, uh, attempt to protect their own status tries to silence and suppress him resonates deeply with the experiences of many LGBTQ plus individuals today. Far too often, our families and churches have prioritized societal or canonical norms and their own shame over unconditional love for their queer children. When faced with something slightly different from the norm, our churches, schools, and families continue to waver in, this, in their practice of the unconditional and uncompromising love that Jesus taught us about. When shame and fear and not love guide our society, human lives are wrecked and dreams are shattered. To, those, to all those who have been once wounded, rejected, or denied their dignity, Jesus offers a profound invitation. Come to me and be part of my family. In his church, there are no outsiders or unwanted children. Our families, the institutionalized church and society can surely can and will surely still reject you countless times. But in God's kingdom, all of us are welcome, celebrated, and loved unconditionally. God's love is uncompromising, and Christ's embrace stretches out to all those who have been pushed to the margins. Jesus today creates a new family, a new society, where we actually get to be whoever God has made us to be. The call to embrace and celebrate the LGBTQ plus community is not a departure from our faith, but rather a fulfillment of its deepest truths. That's why it was such an amazing experience to walk with 21 other members of our community and other people of faith in the Washington, D.C. Pride yesterday. Sharing God's radical love with our LGBTQ plus friends is so important at a time when many in this country and worldwide wish that we could just simply go away and that our rights that we have fought for for decades could somehow be taken away from us. But Kevin Rector wrote beautifully for the Los Angeles Times last week. He said, we are here to stay. LGBTQ people have helped define this country. Our contributions to, the na to this nation's cultural identity are indelible. Throughout history, but especially in the last 100 years since the 1924 founding of, the first nation, of this nation's first gay rights organization, LGBTQ people in California and beyond have defined art, fashion, music, film, literature, and theater for the modern audience. They have reshaped American cities, modern science, our sense of religion and virtue, and our understanding of love, sex, and family. They have honed and improved American democracy and the rule of law for all of us. It is LGBTQ plus people, and particularly the most marginalized among us, who have made us blessedly, brilliantly aware in a quintessentially American way 
that we are more than the boxes that we are born into. And that's why I am now going to take off this store. Where are our rainbow colors? With pride. Many of us have... <clears throat> Many of us have suffered immensely over the years, including at this very place, so that people like Xander, Burl, and I and many others, can finally proudly stand for our beliefs and celebrate our innate dignity. And we do that not in spite of the gospel, but precisely because of the gospel. The Holy Spirit, our God, who since before the creation of time has defied all gender norms and expectations, continues to breathe life into whatever they wish. And in the words of my favorite theologian, Archbishop Rowan Williams, the task of the church is not to exclude, but to draw the boundaries of God's love wider and wider to recognize where God is at work in surprising ways. To all those straight friends who joined us in the parade yesterday, and who supported the cause of justice, equality, and peace over the years, thank you. We see your love. We need your mums and dads' hugs, and we couldn't have done without your support. To all those who have suffered harm committed by the church, please know that I'm there with you, and I do know your pain. To all those who have been rejected by their families and friends, you are Jesus' brothers and sisters, and there, you cannot do any better than that. To all those who continue to struggle with their faith and identity, know that we all face moments when we need to realize and come to terms with the fact that we simply don't have it all figured out yet. To all those who feel just a little bit different, or never seem to fit into the boxes that the world seems to want to create for us, be brave, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Or in the words of a logo from one of the t-shirts yesterday, be you, others will adjust. And finally, to all of us gathered around this Eucharistic table, welcome to the Lord's Feast, a God's Feast set for all of God's people. Here at this table, the only identity that matters is that of one family, one body of Christ, gathered so that the world may see that God's love is unconditional and uncompromising and God's call to justice, equality, and peace will reverberate at, until the end of times, no matter how much anyone might to stifle it. Amen.